Hello and welcome to the Verderon channel, I'm Pierre Lancet. Art has a long history of engaging with conflict and violence. From the antiquities, through Goya to Guernica, our museums are filled with depictions of battles, pogroms, uprisings, and the violent suppression. Not all of these stories are told from the perspective of the victors. Many contemporary creatives have continued this tradition. While the position of the official war artist seems to have gone out of fashion, conflict hasn't. Artists are compelled to document the violence and conflict that for some is the matter of their everyday. Kaylin Wilson Goldie, who is my guest today, has written an account of the work of three such artists. Her book, Beautiful, Gruesome and True, Artists at Work in the Face of War, recounts the violence which the artist Teresa Margulies, Ama Kandwa and the collective Abonadora find in their everyday lives. The documents they produce have found their way into the mainstream contemporary art world for better or often for worse. The book is part narrative, part art criticism, part journalism. Wilson Goldie draws on her decades of experience as a prolific writer and critic who contributes regularly to publications like Art Forum, Aperture and After All. As ever, you'll find links to the works we discuss in the show notes. From there, you can also join my newsletter with my writing on art and culture, as well as to support my work. Kaylin, welcome to the show. I'm happy to be here. Thank you. You sent me quite a disarming note earlier this morning saying that you fully expect me to give you a hard time about the book. And maybe I'm going soft, but I'm not necessarily interested in doing that. Or maybe you've written a book that I really needed to read at the moment. Maybe it's a slightly different book that I end up discussing on the network usually. So to help us think about this, I'm going to ask you in very straightforward terms, who you are. Well, I would describe myself as a journalist first and a critic and a writer just because it's an easier designation. Mm. I have always wanted to be a writer. I probably wanted to be a novelist when I was much younger, but I worked at my high school newspaper and I worked at my college newspaper and I went straight into journalism school from undergrad. Um, and of course, I read the village voice i actually paid mm. to read the village voice because i was living outside of new york <laughs> and i wanted to be a public intellectual like susan sontag and have the impact that she had i mean that was a desire that i had as a young person um and i worked in downtown art magazines for a few years in new york and was frustrated um I mean, which was an amazing opportunity. And I worked with great people and just random encounters. Like I worked in an art magazine that was really focused on the market, which helped mm -hmm. me to see the money side of the art world very fast. But it happened that I went through the fact checking on the more litigious stories that that magazine ran. And mm -hmm. the legal counsel for the magazine was Mel Leventhal who's the ex-husband of Alice Walker, who's a major mm -hmm. sort of human rights figure in the U.S. And so yeah. just to hear his response to the issues and the stories was an education in itself and, and a window into a broader world of issues that really weren't being covered by mm. art magazines in the late 90s. So that was amazing and wonderful, and it was fun to run around downtown New York as a young person, but it was annoying at that time how provincial the New York art world was mm. and you know there was a wider world where things were happening and you would hear things like well anything worth covering will come through New York eventually and that just wasn't true and and was so it? I mean things did no. come to New York in <laughs> big tranches. Yes, sure but but not everything and not everything mm. as fully as it would have been in its context and I had you know I wasn't an art history major I wasn't a studio art major. I took as much art history as I could without having to declare a minor because I wasn't allowed to, uh, <laughs> be, both because it's what my father had done and he was like, absolutely not. Good, wise words. <laughs> yes. And I, I did English literature and what was called at the time foreign affairs, which is really international relations with um, an emphasis on the Middle East, because I had a Lebanese grandmother who spoke about Lebanon in the past tense and made me curious as to why no one had, in the family had ever gone back. And so mm. in 2002, I went to Beirut for the summer to learn Arabic because I didn't know it. You know, I spoke two words to her. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and and Katrin David's Contemporary Arab Representations Project, which was a sort of mm -hmm. medium term series of exhibitions looking at contemporary art scenes in different cities in the Middle East, that was already up and running. And she was there doing research. And, you know, Beirut is a small city and it's easy to meet people. And so just that summer, I was able to see what was actually happening on the ground and the kind of discussions that were happening and realized that there was a lot to learn there and a lot of activity that was that was free of some of the market pressures that you would find mm -hmm. um, in certainly in New York in the time and probably in cities in Europe. So I moved there and thought that I would stay for a year or two and stayed very, very full time for 15 years. And one of the reasons to go there was just for me personally was to not be an editor anymore, but to focus on writing. Um, and I got a job doing that for a newspaper, which was fantastic because I had to write three or four times a week. And mm. I had to go out and find things to write about and write about them really fast and get to know people and who were the gallerists and who were the curators and who were the intellectuals and who were the communist intellectuals, who were the conservative <laughs> intellectuals, you know, um, what was the whole sectarian array of, of approaches to arts and culture and you know at a time when people were very suspicious of contemporary art as a what was the paper of interest uh it was so it was called the daily star not to be mm -hmm. confused with the daily star that was in the uk uh which i only learned about going to <laughs> london and saying you know oh i work for the daily star <laughs> the daily star started for expats working in the oil industry in the region mm -hmm. and at the time it was distributed with the International Herald Tribune. It was this oh. attempt to have a sort of international newspaper where in many different cities, you would find the IHT with a local paper folded inside. Mm. And, you know, we had the back page of the paper for arts and culture. Mm -hmm. So I wrote for that as a full-time, very, very full-time job. Then the war in 2006 happened in the summer of 2006. Well, first there's the assassination of Rafi Kariri in 2005, which retrospectively marked an end to the post-war period in Lebanon after the civil war, mm -hmm. where there was a lot of discussions about, you know, how, and this, like the artists were very involved in this, how to rebuild the city after the war. And then after Hediri was assassinated in 2005, I think there was a shift out of the post-war period into something else. And when the war in 2006 between Israel and Hezbollah happened, you know, there was like a skirmish on the border one morning mm -hmm. where Hezbollah kidnapped two soldiers. And I flew out that night to go back to New York just for a visit and mm -hmm. landed and found out that the airport had been bombed a couple hours after I flew mm -hmm. out. And then I spent yeah. the next 10 days trying to figure out how to get back in the country and mm -hmm. how to keep the paper from not closing down the arts and culture page on the last page, because mm -hmm. there was a shortage of paper in the country. And so they were cutting down the number of pages. It's the first time I felt, I think, this much conviction about what I was doing, where I just thought you cannot stop mm -hmm. reporting on arts and culture in a time of war just because there's not enough paper. You have to insist that it's still important and you have to still put it out there. And, you know, artists are still working. People are still thinking it, it has to remain. And so I made this really convoluted journey back through Paris and through Damascus. Imagine at the time you could fly very safely mm -hmm. into Damascus and get a $500 taxi to take you an hour across the border. And, and we managed to keep it going. Wow. And I think because it does, in circumstances like that, it really matters. Like it's a kind of, it would be this kind of capitulation to to not to stop doing it. And um, so a lot of a lot of what eventually went into the book comes from that. You know, starts there. Yeah, I was going to say that this sounds all like quite a very convincing pitch for for the book. Yeah. So to help our listeners along a little bit with the story. I think it would be fair to introduce them to the three characters in the book, all of whom are artists practicing under the conditions of war, kind of in circumstances that you describe, these kind of perma wars, conflicts that kind of yeah. come and go, conflicts that are known to the international community for two weeks of, of the year. They are 
intense and everyone is interested and they are the subject of international scrutiny. But most of the time, they just kind of go into these very slow, painful, excruciating, murderous stasis that you describe affecting Lebanon, but you also write about other regions and yeah. being subject to exactly the same processes in the book. We discussed about how to choose your favourites, um, and I think we're not going to be able to do this really, but the book looks at the practices of the Mexican artist Teresa Margales, who is based in Ciudad Juarez at the Mexican border with the US, where she essentially witnesses for years upon upon years the the violence perpetuated by drug cartels. Uh, you write about the anonymous collective Abu Nadar in Syria, who for maybe almost 10 years, maybe a little bit less than that, documented and gave witness to some of the goings-on in Syria. And you also write about Amar Kanwan, who's based in southeastern India, turning his camera, turning his lens onto really quite quite horrible things going on around him but also quite trivial things like globalization and kind of the encroachment of capital onto absolutely everything. So we know your personal story. Why this book? Why now? What, what brings these artists together? And, and also maybe I can ask you to reflect on how you've written it. What kind of a book is this? Because this is not an academic text right. in a sense that you might disagree with. Um, it's not a theoretical text yep. as much as it doesn't really have footnotes. Um, how, why do we bring the, these disparate places in the world, these, these people, together? I mean, I had a question at the beginning of the book that I still have now, which is, or maybe it's two questions, which is why, um, you know, clearly, Amar Kanwar, Teresa Margoyes, and the members of Abu Nadara are very capable image makers and object makers and artists and very intelligent and and have very forceful personalities and could do a lot of things in the world besides mm. making what is presented to the public as contemporary art. I mean, I think their commitment to some of the people and subjects they're covering comes first and the form of contemporary art comes second. And so mm -hmm. I had the question of why, I mean, why, why make art? Why, why work in the contemporary art world at all, you know? Is it more effective than mm -hmm. straight documentary, advocacy work, you know, fighting, mm -hmm. doing human rights stuff, development on the ground, writing academic, more academic books that might have, you know, a theoretical argument. So why do they make, why make art, why does art seem like an adequate response to mm -hmm. grueling, grinding conflict? And what does it do? Because I'm, I'm very skeptical of the interest that international museums and contemporary art centers have mm -hmm. in whatever the latest conflict is. And, and I'm, I am skeptical of why they show works that reflect on conflicts internationally. And, and, and there's a big question of whether or not it's just aestheticizing someone else's misery. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to try and answer those questions, which of course I am not able to answer to this day, but I think maybe <laughs> leaving them open is, and so it's, you know, it's an extended articulation of the question. Mm -hmm. I'm not a theoretical writer or thinker in any way. I mean, I, I read theory, I discuss theory, I'm interested in it, but I don't have any pretense to write it or put forth a kind of a theory that can be applied in that way. So it, it was always going to be for me a mix of reportage mm -hmm. and criticism. Um, and it's also an extent, I mean, it's kind of an extended exercise in how to describe the experience of artworks mm -hmm. that can't necessarily be captured in images. I think we should try to do that a little bit in, 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 in our conversation and, and ask you to describe some of the practices. You've already mentioned the word efficacy, and, and my listeners will know that this is the thing I really concentrate on. But I want us to park this, because what you said later is that there is something to be gained from trying to describe the work in words. I think you were about to say that also you, yeah. you decided not to print images in the book, for instance, and that is to a certain extent quite odd. But the reason yeah. that I really wanted us to have this conversation after reading the book was that Actually, the writing does something that neither my kind of numerical approach to, you know, is this effective 
is this a good bang for your buck? You know, are, are we saving lives with these artworks? Somehow the way you wrote this text makes this all kind of worthwhile and in a way that I find bizarrely touching and <laughs> I wasn't expecting to. So why don't we try to figure out where that is based and whether that's something that pertains to the practices, whether it pertains to the criticism, which is what you did here, whether it's something that happens despite the art world or, or somehow within it. And maybe maybe we we do that by, by simply describing one of the practices in, in a little bit of detail and if that's not too much to to, to get you yeah. to reproduce some of your, your your prose poetry. I mean probably the most obvious example, I'm I don't know if I should do it because it might be the one that's that people know the best already, but today's in Margoya's is pavilion. Mm -hmm. Um, for the Venice Biennale in 2009, for the Mexico mm -hmm. Pavilion, is still one of the most insane works of art I have ever experienced. And, you know, mm -hmm. the problem with Venice is that, you know, X many people are able to go to Venice. It is not widely available to everyone. Mm -hmm. But I so I wanted to make the experience of seeing that work uh, really visceral for people who read it, which is that, you know, you go into this very old crumbling palazzo, in Venice, beautiful, but falling apart, which, and this is a side note, mm -hmm. and this is a part that was cut out from the book, is also the palazzo that belonged to the family of the, whose daughter had an affair with Hemingway, which is part oh. of Across the River and Into the Trees, which is a terrible mm -hmm. novel by Hemingway, but, but so that <laughs> family owned that. And so I thought this was a sort of mind blowing connection, but this was cut from the uh, book. Okay, bad but so, revenge. <laughs> yeah. So in 2009, today's in Margoyas and, um, the curator Quatimoc Medina did a proposal for the Mexico Pavilion where they took over a crumbling, beautiful palazzo in Venice and they brought to it a project or, you know, the refuse of a project that she had been working on where she collects blood and like really blood and guts and mm -hmm. trash from crime scenes in Mexico. And so she will literally go to the scene of a drive-by shooting and mop up the blood on the ground and then dilute it, soak it and re-soak it um, in mm -hmm. or rehydrate it and then, so what she put together in Venice was a series of, I mean, basically a building sized installation with various performances that were happening and mm -hmm. objects that were on display, including family members of people who had been killed, cleaning, mopping the floor of this palazzo with water that included the blood of these crime scenes. So literally mopping the floor of a Venetian palazzo with blood. And you could smell it. It was not unnoticeable what the materiality of the work was. And you, so you, you entered this pavilion and you were given instructions as you entered. And then as you moved through, you could only begin to know what you were looking at by reading the wall texts and reading the mm. information about it. So there was, there's constantly this tension in her work by being puzzled with what you're seeing and not understanding what it is. And then it's slowly dawning on you that this is, you know, the blood of crime scenes, um, the dirt from places where people have been killed, the glass from shattered windshields and drive-by shootings. And, mm -hmm. you know, she's making these rarefied objects. She makes jewels from the glass. She makes what look like monochromatic abstract paintings from blood and mud. And again, she mops, you know, the floors with, with hydrated blood that she's collected. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it's it was a really shattering experience to to realize because you know it's like a maze through the palazzo yeah. and then you're halfway through and you realize what you're looking at and then you're sort of stuck and then there was always more i mean it's completely over the top you know there were more paintings there were more jewels there was people embroidering text messages from you know different cartels that had sent as warnings not to take revenge and and you, mm -hmm. you know those become artworks and then there were also all of these performances that you could read about that were happening as part of the project that were things that you didn't see, but only, you know, heard about or read about. And there was also a card that you received when you went in to see the exhibition, which was the size of a credit card. And mm -hmm. it had a photograph of a shattered skull, like a bloodied and shattered mm -hmm. um, skull on one side. And it said card to cut cocaine with, which was sort of, you know, 
making complicit mm -hmm. the partying of people in the art world who would be feeding the demand for the drugs that are fueling the economy that is causing all of the violence on the border. So I think it's important to try to locate the origin of this practice. You, I read in your book that so that Jerez has what 1.3 million people living in it, so it's not a tiny border town, but it accounts for 3,000 homicides every year, which seems a little bit out of proportion, even by mm -hmm. you know, the kind of blasé standards of, yeah. of our life. So essentially, this is a, a city that's been completely destroyed by the fact that it's just a very convenient waypoint through which to smuggle drugs into the US. And of course, yeah. there are competing forces in that um, who compete with each other so much that, that murdering people who are both involved and people who are not involved becomes an everyday practice. Yeah. You described also in the book, Margaret, um, becoming engaged already in the 90s in this kind of very necrophilic activity in, in the city where she, together with a group of people, she ends up doing things like visiting the morgue and, and kind of offering to pay for funerals of young people provided yeah. she could get access to their cadavers. This is Hermann Nietzsche on steroids in a, in a certain sense. Yeah. I want to ask you to situate this a little bit and try to make a comparison between what it is that Margulis did and does the aesthetic interventions she can make within her own environment, how they relate to this intervention in Venice. And Margulis, of course, out of the three artists that we talk about, is kind of the best known. Like she, she has a gallery, she has objects that circulate in mm -hmm. exhibition and in the art market. But yeah. I think the 2009 project that you just described, I think, is quite, you know, quite a departure. And it also, also happens at a time when the art world was already bored of shock but hasn't mm -hmm. quite absorbed that shock actually isn't always simulated. That was the, the really shocking thing in, in this Mexican pavilion, the fact that you know, yeah. this was not just a, we, we're going to treat you to this little thrill. This is a yeah. supposedly unavoidable, but, you know, question mark here, a reality. Yeah. So, yeah, how, how do we connect through that Juarez with, with, with Venice and, and how many steps yeah. do we take? Yeah, so she is from Culiacan, which is another border town. Um, and it's also the stomping ground of El Chapo, who's no, now imprisoned in the U.S., but he was the leader of a major cartel and probably mm -hmm. the, the drug lord in Mexico who has sort of actually benefited the most from things like mm -hmm. NAFTA. She's originally a photographer, which I think is interesting, and so comes to the practice that she has now as an fundamentally as someone who's walking around with a big camera. That's how she started. And she was part of a collective called Semafo in Mexico City. And I think, you know, I don't think it's possible to extract her work from Mexico City in the mm -hmm. 80s and 90s when she started and when Semafo was working together. And I trying to counter certain national narratives that were part of modern art in Mexico or the sort of narrative of modern art in Mexico mm -hmm. and the revolution, the Mexican revolution, the post-revolutionary period, and to, as a way to kind of capture the, the anxieties and realities of young people in an increasingly violent society at that time. And so the move into the morgue came from her own interest in forensics and Semifo as a kind of anarchist, nihilist performance, initially performance mm -hmm. collective. But what's interesting is the split from Semifo. You see there's a real continuity between some of the more poetic and quieter work that they did and what she ends up, what she continues doing as a solo practitioner. Or, and this is an argument that I try to sort of tease out in the book, as, you know, okay, she's an artist, the work that she does comes under her name, she's the one represented mm -hmm. by the gallery, but of course, none of it is, it's like film, none of it is ever done alone. So she, you know, she has a foundation, mm -hmm. she has a place in Ciudad Juarez, she has a team of people that she's always working with, and this grows out to include the subjects of the work. So I do see it still as a kind of collective practice that she's doing but like all three artists i think that they they try to sort of hook into what they can in the art world to get the work shown and have it circulate and to tell those stories i've sensed you would kind of slow down before the word collective and 
There's a couple of things that you try to tackle in the book to do with that. One of them is the question of how an artist interfaces with a community when the artistic intervention is surplus to requirements, quite objectively, because the artistic practice, as we have think already tacitly agreed, doesn't actually change the material circumstances in right. in the slightest. And um, we can we can talk about you know how we distribute the profits of of artwork sales, but that's beside the point, I think. Yeah. But there is, um, I think, for probably all three of your artists, this kind of reality that no one's necessarily asked them to do any of this. Right. Margaret comes in and she says, oh, look, I've, I've got a degree in photography. I mean, maybe she doesn't. Really know. I've got a camera, she says, in the 90s. We can do this and maybe in 30 years' time we'll figure out that this will have been for the good. Yeah. And I'm really trying to stop myself from kind of jumping into the critique that I usually reserve for social practice where someone mandates an artist to go and do social amelioration work on a budget. This yeah. isn't quite what, what people like Margaret are doing because... She doesn't have a contract. No one's no one's telling her how to do this. No one. She's not accountable to any of this. But then she has this possibility of presenting what she has collected as a community back to us as a validation of her own work. Now, I don't know, even from reading your text and even from studying a little bit of her practice, I don't know whether whether that community is real, whether she is simply constituting it every time she needs someone to write three paragraphs of a wall text, whether these people do exist, whether that collective yeah. practice is indeed collective, or whether it's not a series of these kind of ad hoc extractive situations. No, she tells a good story. So she was born in Culiacan, Semifo, she sort of came of age in Mexico City. And then since the biennial in 2009, She's now based between Madrid and Mexico City and Culiacan. So she sort of triangulates those three locations. But she has Madrid. And so I met her there. Mm -hmm. She has that as the sort of quiet place to go to. Because, I mean, it was interesting. One of the things that was important to me at the beginning in sort of laying out the structure of the book was that I didn't want to write about like fully diaspora artists who were, you know, mm -hmm. living in New York or London or Berlin and going to sort of, you know, hot zones and then coming back. I wanted people that had a sustained, you know, decade long engagement with the places that they were making work about. And, you know, the spokesperson and major filmmaker of Abu Nadara are now in Paris and she's in Madrid and Kanwar is in Delhi. So mm. there is like a way in which that distance and separation um, and proximity kind of fall apart. But she tells a great story about going to Juarez with her camera and meeting a woman in the street who mistakes her for a Spanish journalist and says, you know, mm -hmm. come here. I want you to take pictures of this. And she starts pointing to mm -hmm. demolition projects. Like you need to document these houses that are getting knocked down for real estate development and for speculation, because it's not just that everybody is getting killed here and that, you know, there's drug traffic. It is also that people are taking advantage of the chaos to continue a development and for profit, not only from drugs, but also from real estate speculation. And so that was her in with this community of trans sex workers that were sort of stuck in the city, weren't able to leave, had various things tying them there. So that is the sort of most recent community that she constitutes mm -hmm. in her work. Um, but those those women are often part of the performances and often travel with her. And I mean, how much you be, like, do you believe that what is being used in the palazzo is actually blood? Do you believe that these women are who she says they are? I mean, mm. there is a sense in which she demands that you either yeah. believe her and take it all in or you leave. Like, And she is that sort of forceful, I think, in how she mm. presents it. But when she initially took portraits, of these trans women that she met, she took pictures of them posed on the floors of the clubs that they used to work in, which had been torn down. So it's basically a rubble. And mm. she took their portraits and she offered each of them a print. And they were all super disappointed because they are pictured in the middle distance. And they wanted fabulous close up portraits of themselves mm. that they could use in their work. And they were like, what, you know, what is this? Why am I so far away? Why am I so small in the picture? And I thought it was an interesting reflection of, you know, what each person is trying to get out of 
that kind of relationship, but shows the tensions, but I think also points to what she brings of them. It's not just the conditions that they're living in. It's not just how dire the circumstances are. It's also the the forcefulness of how those women imagine themselves to be and how they see themselves and want to be seen by the world. And I think that's a strength of the work that that is not the most obvious and it's not the most sensational, but I think it's important. And I think maybe, I mean, my hope is that that will be part of the plinth when she does the plinth mm. in London in 2024. This is kind of an interesting tie-in. You were giving me this this perfectly well fact-checked answer. I'm I was thinking that actually one of the values in the way you wrote the book, and in maybe not in Magdalene's case, but but it, with Amakandwa and definitely with Abanadora, there is this implied contract between a community and the institution of art, whether that's the artist or the art world it's, it, itself, that we kind of do this double bluff where this woman who waves the photographer over saying, come and take pictures of this for posterity, and we maybe ask you in a moment to, to, to describe the same process with Abunadora, this, this process in which there's, there's a, an element of trust. Now, that trust is inevitably broken. I will refer listeners to my conversations with Renzo Martins uh, on, on the network. This quite often goes very, very wrong, and the art world is quite happy to be completely extractivist. And then, then maybe as a, as a critique, I kind of want to propose that actually even the plinth with Margulis is already this kind of slippage, because in as much as I have ever sympathy for the plight of trans sex workers in Central and Latin America, that work, which to for listeners is essentially a, what, like 300 papier mache masks of faces of of trans workers that's sculpture being is being proposed yeah. to be made of that and eventually will be washed away by the rain the way that this gesture is being read and reveled in by the lobbying groups that, that support trans rights in the uk it's uh, as though that they were trying to make trans people in the uk somehow equally deserving of this this intervention and and rescue and support and money and blah blah right. whatever it is that in some you know fairy tale world art actually brings. So there's a collapsing in which actually people in the UK end up feeling a little bit better because trans sex workers in in Mexico are being killed. Like that is that is an unfortunate possibility that I think is already contained even within that work. Yeah. But I'm 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 now going to ask you to try to think about this with the example of the film collective Abu Nadara and ask you to introduce them a little because you you refer to them in a book as something that kind of spontaneously came through a public demand and there's this pretense of only making films for the purpose of giving voice, giving dignity, being a witness and that's contained even in the name of the collective. And I think that's interesting because it's really only trying to deal with like one very thin layer of the things that art promises to its subjects. Abu Nadara is an anonymous collective of Syrian filmmakers who actually preceded the uprising that began in 2011. And, you know, that uprising has led to over a decade of war and conflict and destruction, I mean, total destruction of the country, and also destruction of a revolutionary movement that seemed like it had real potential for at least a few weeks or months at the very beginning. But it was actually a project that began earlier and was people who chose to work together, make films without using their names as a way to try to escape the only models that were available for them at the time to make films, which was either be a part of the state Ministry of Culture um, mm -hmm. national film organization apparatus, which is effectively to make to find a way to make films with funding from the regime, or to take funding from you know French or other foreign media companies that had an agenda and they had a frame that they for which they wanted to see you know the Orient and it was still a very exoticizing 
Orientalist gaze on, you know, oppressed women or but I'm going to interject and, and say that you you acknowledge in the book that is essentially like a globalist agenda that is not just to do with like post colonial legacies. No, like earlier you mentioned that El Chapo was the main beneficiary of NAFTA. Yeah. So actually, one of the things that go that runs through the book is the destructive force of globalization and. The art world, as you just described, you know, these kind of French film producers depending on the, the yeah. descending upon the Middle East in the 2000s. Yeah. Saying, look, we'll give you a quarter yeah. of a million dollars to make your film, but you will be a vassal for the rest of time. Like, right. And there's also a local, there's a local manifestation of this also, which is that, you know, if you're making yeah. films in Syria with a certain name, everyone will know before they even see your film, oh, I know that this person is uh, is Sunni or this is, this person is Alawi, this person is from a moneyed family, this person is from a uh, you know, poor background. And so there's a sense in which the interpretation of the work is already in formation because of those sectarian or class-based markers that come with the name. And so I speak from what Abu Nadara puts out in the world and the few interactions I've had with um, Sharif Kiwan, who's the spokesperson. But so my understanding of their desires at the very beginning was to escape actually all three of these things. As an experiment in making films without naming the artist. And it's, I think it's an admirable project. Mm -hmm. um, and then the uprising, so, you know, the Arab Spring begins in 2011, and the uprising, you know, against all odds, Syria was the last place that ended up happening at all, and it didn't happen at all. And against all odds, you have this major protest movement that begins, and Abu Nadara immediately shifted into this mode of, of releasing these short one to five minute videos every Friday in solidarity with protests that were happening also on Fridays, because Friday is the day where people go to the mosque. So you have the afternoon open. So this was a day of protest. And, you know, the protests had names and they had slogans and they had songs. And for Abu Nandara, they had a video that was released and made as available as possible. So Vimeo, Facebook, Twitter, freely circulating. TikTok, I think. Yeah. I don't, was TikTok even around in 2011? No, I don't know. I'm being facetious. And yeah. in fact, I think there's, there's a worthwhile comparison. Or maybe I, I'd, I'd like you to, to describe a couple of these early videos just, just yeah. holistically because they're very short, like to the point. And that's partly yeah. why they kind of predate the, the TikTok yeah. paradigm in a sense, yeah. even though um, they yeah. do that under quite difficult circumstances. And and stylistically there there seems to be an incredible range of diversity in how they in in how they're made and and what kind of footage. Some of them are straight interviews head and shoulders with a person. Sometimes their face obscured, sometimes not. And you we're sort of plunged into the middle of a conversation. You know, I remember there's one about a child talking about a massacre in a breadline. There are interviews with fighters on all sides, so fighters with the regime, fighters with the Free Syrian Army. There's a really uh, memorable short video called The Islamic State for Dummies Part 1, which is an interview with you know, a functionary of the information Islamic State. And the, it's a woman who's behind the camera because he says something about creating like a real nation state out of this, and she just starts laughing mm -hmm. from behind the camera. And her laughter is really the... <laughs> the enduring power, because I mean, the man just seems ridiculous and what he's saying seems so fanciful and yeah. she sort of calls him out by laughing. Then there are much sort of music video style, you know, media studies, people love them, deconstructions of news media. So there's one Fox News commentator who's, who's cut up to just say, kill them over and over again, which seems to, similar to Omer Fast's CNN concocted, if you mm. remember that film. Yeah. Um, and then there's one of, you know, a toy soldier who's set up in on a cobblestone street and just shown to be crawling along the street to a sort of nationalist anthem in the background. And there's a lot with what you see and the sound you hear are not from the same source. Mm -hmm. And and some of them are, are clips from films. Um, some of them are clearly shot by um, journalists or people who are working in the media doing reportage. Um, and, you know, lots of like, interviews with seemingly ordinary people. So you have a woman who's trying to do a beauty school in a bomb shelter with no electricity and is absolutely charming. And I think similar to, you know, the portraits of the trans women in Teresa Margoyas' work is there is a kind of 
a love and an appreciation and an intimacy with the subjects so that it's not this sort of cold documentary style, but really um, a closeness mm -hmm. that I think is very powerful. And, and this, this came to be packaged and presented to the wider world with a set of concepts and theories, which was the concept of emergency cinema and the bullet film. And then this grew into what really became Abu Nadara's campaign, which was the fight to actually put in the UN Declaration for Human Rights, the right to a dignified image. And that is something that they mm. were really fighting for and, and trying to achieve. And they published a book in Arabic that's also online and for free that is, you know, many essays and descriptions of, of why the right to a dignified image is needed and, and how it could be achieved and, and gets into sort of talk about rights with photography, you know, rights as property versus human rights. Mm. And this is also where they lost a lot of people because they were like, oh, you know, human rights, this is such a neoliberal discourse. We're not interested. Well, but, but let's, let's talk bit by bit as to how we've got there, because there's a first a question of how this straight to Vimeo production actually wins any eyeballs. The fact that this, this takes off locally. Or, mm. I'm, you've, you've led me to believe in the text that this was a big thing within Syria. Yeah. And it's not like we don't have precedents and we don't know that Cairo had during the Arab Spring its own kind of filmmaking movement. And, yeah. and people, whether they would call themselves artists or not, would participate in forms of culture production. But there's a slightly insidious way in which we've already noted that some of these people would have been artists who might have flirted with either regime well, actually with regime, either local regime or external regime funding and those kind of positionalities, but also quite quickly, and maybe you have a handle on like what the chronology is, when the ethical and the rights proposal starts getting entwined with the external Western art world's growth of interest and in what Abu Nadara mm -hmm. too, because Abu Nadara become absorbed into the art world machine, not commercially, but they they hit some 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 film festivals and of course yep. they do hit documenta because yep. this is the kind of content the documenta and Venice. But then even that goes wrong. No, they right. they they pull out. They they, yeah. they kind of decompose as a as a collective. Uh, you know, we we seem to know one name or at least you've disclosed one name. Maybe there are yeah. more. The argument for the right to a dignified image, which it's not an uninteresting, mm -hmm. if not a losing theory, and all, but it's interesting, for instance, that they choose for that to remain in Arabic. And yeah, what are, what are the steps? How how do we treat this as art, therefore subjected to art criticism, the way you have done? I mean, I think there's a there's a, a direct line that can be drawn from the desire for anonymity prior to the uprising in 2011 and the reasons for that and the campaign for a dignified image. I mean, I think those are part of mm -hmm. the same project. So I think there's a real consistency there. I mean, the problem with anonymity, that kind of anonymity before 2011 and the anonymity after is that after it was for security reasons and for safety. And I can't, I don't know about the circulation in Syria, but in the wider region, for sure. Well, I mean, there was a problem immediately of the images coming out of Syria couldn't be verified. And there weren't, you know, mm. reporters couldn't get in there without being killed. So there was not enough um, verifiable journalistic information coming out. And so Abu Nadada's videos filled a kind of void and they knew that. I mean, this was, they knew that they were addressing this void very deliberately between, um, you know, what the regime was saying versus what people were trying to piece together versus what activists were trying to get out. And they really play a lot with ambiguity. They refuse to say, you know, where the videos are made or if they're new, if it's old footage as a kind of high-minded questioning of, you know, the truth that images can tell. But then what kind of collective did they become? I think it changed a lot. I think the membership probably changed. And I think it probably got bigger and then smaller. And, and we don't know. I never set out to expose who they were, or even really to know. But I think it will be mm -hmm. interesting one day looking back to know more. And I think I hope that there comes a time when people who were involved in making those films for Abu Nadara are free to talk about it. I mean, there's a problem with fetishizing the idea of a collective. Mm -hmm. I have 
an ideal of how a collective might work with, you know, everyone has equal members, equal say in decision making, but that's my fantasy of how a collective work. And I think other people I don't, have don't different think ideas. Like that, <laughs> yeah. So, but so in keeping yourself as this anonymous collective, you allow all these things not to be known. And Abu Nadara has plenty of detractors who, you know, and it's all hearsay, but, you know, who talk about how they work as being not, not what the ideals that they set out to do. I mean, one young filmmaker told me, he's like, it's like Uber. It's basically, you know, journalists and fixers who send their stuff in and then have no control over it. And so that's less, that's less, that's less <laughs> nice than we think it is. I mean, the art world really failed them in a lot of ways, I think, mm. because the reason why I think those examples happened where Abu Nadara pulled out of things or was dissatisfied with how they were being presented is because there was no one to protect them. And the person who would have protected them are the galleries, right? It's gallery representation that would have, would have mediated between hmm. them and the institution or them and the curators. And I think a lot of it was just like, you know, unfamiliarity with how nasty the art world can be and how transactional it can be and how sort of exploitative and just being shocked that you know, their work wasn't being presented in the way they thought it was going to be. And them also not caring. I mean, I think it's mm. kind of refreshing the way in which they, they didn't give a shit about a lot of the, you know, prestige of the art world. And it just wasn't there. Like they would use it, the possibility of it to have their work shown and have it circulate. And they were interested in that. And I think they are interested in cinematic history and being a part of it, but they are not I don't think interested in in being you know well regarded in the art world. I think they just don't care. I mean, I think it's interesting to keep the right to the image book in Arabic, and so many of the films have so many layers of of meaning that depend on familiarity. So there's one video in particular called "In the Name of the Father," with a young woman in pretty extreme close up speaking about. I mean, she's speaking about Bashar al-Assad. I don't know if she ever uses his name, but it's clear that she's talking about the president of the country. And she's mm -hmm. also been made up and probably had plastic surgery to look exactly like a Lebanese pop star named Haifa Wehbi. So if you know Haifa Wehbi, you know that she looks exactly like her and has modeled her sort of her style on her. So that's sort of one layer. And then her accent, like I can't, hear this but other you know people who are much more fluent than i am can place her class the damascus neighborhood she lives in from how she's speaking and so like that's another layer that's only accessible to a certain a much smaller audience that's no. going to see it so i feel like they are in a way they're playing with all of that and they're maybe their most meaningful audience is the the closest and the smallest and the least accessible to the international art world. Yeah, I think that would be my guess as well. I mean, the failure of you know Abu Nadara to make it in the Western art world, I think, should be considered as an irrelevance. I mean, it's 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 great that that the art world didn't really bother. Yeah. But I did tell you that I want to quiz you on the word true, and I think that's already okay. connected to who it is that we are talking to, that we are addressing the artworks to. The word true is part of your title. Yeah. What, what do we do with any of this? <laughs> I mean, we, we've talked just now about this kind of pseudo-documentaries. Teresa Margulis makes documentaries that the subjects of these documentaries don't necessarily find true to their own version of themselves. Yeah. And particularly when we try to consider that actually they need to have different audiences, these works. But somehow in an ideal world, you know, Teresa Margulis would be enough of an artist and art would be remunerated enough for her not to have to have a dealer in, in Switzerland mm -hmm. or Germany. If that work stayed within Mexico, it would probably be for the best of the art and, and the people around it. But that's not the case. Therefore, we are compelled to start making... Aesthetic claims, check, you do that convincingly, for which I thank you. But we also, as you try to do, but very kind of loosely start making truth claims about, again, it's the question we've been addressing. What does this, what do these works compel us to do politically, materially? It's interesting because you said that you were going to query me about the one of the words in the title, but you didn't tell me which one. And so <laughs> which, which I, one do you I, think it was, going to I be? was sure it was going to be true as 
because yeah, I mean, every, <laughs> all three of those words were meant as a provocation. How I came up with the title was there's an Egyptian artist named Tassan Khan who wrote an essay mm. for Bidun several years ago about shabby music in Cairo called Loud, Insistent, and Dumb, <laughs> which I thought was a fantastic title for a very yeah. uh, evocative essay about music. And Hassan is a terrific artist and a great thinker and, and a former colleague and a friend. And so I wanted something that had that power. And I also, I wanted it to be descriptive. So just to, to signal from the very beginning that description was going to be part of the book. So yeah, I mean, beautiful, because some of the work is, against mm -hmm. all odds, quite contemplative and, and, and gruesome as an acknowledgement. Like people that I really don't know very well that I tell about the book or that I give a copy to. Um, and I have to sort of say, oh, you know, this is not really like, I'm not a very gothic person. Yes, so I, I don't be have, put I off got by. Chocolates. I would have got you some chocolates, but here's a book instead. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I know yeah. this, this movie. Um, and, and true because, well, these conflicts are real and they're, our connection to them is real mm -hmm. and it's not a fictional universe or a fantasy history or fake archaeology. I mean, I think there are a lot of great, fabulous projects in art and in literature that are very important that also often, you know, through the guise of fiction, tell you something true about the world. But it was important to me that there were some facts on the ground about mm -hmm. the situations that all of these artists were addressing. And so I wanted that there. What kind of truth do these artworks tell about those situations? I don't know. What do you think as a reader? <laughs> what do I think as a reader? I think this is possibly the most softball interview I've conducted in a long time. So I might, we might, we might. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, don't be, don't be sorry. I think, I think this is testament to the fact that there is a utility to this kind of writing. And I even hate myself for having used the word utility. And I want to finish up to try to think about this in a couple of ways that I wonder if you see an opposition in the same way that I do. So you make a brief invocation in the book to the history of artists engaging with violence, now mm -hmm. Guernica is a, an obvious example which has been discussed much, I'm sure you've written about Guernica because it's kind of rite of passage for, for a critic, mm -hmm. um, but you know you go to Caravaggio and to, yeah. to the antiquities, you know, it's, it's blood and gore is, is, is there and it's not always there for the glory of the victors as we, we might occasionally be told. So there's that history in which we of course have the distance but there's also another thing that's happening that's even a more kind of industrialized version of the community-based activities that you described. I'm thinking in particular of um, the conflict in Ukraine now, which happens to have a whole PR machine to do with culture and art mm -hmm. with it. Now I have to clear my throat a little bit. I used to represent the artist Nikita Kadan. I showed his work. I sold his work. I love some of his work. I think he's a fantastic thinker. But he is now, as an artist soldier kind of figure, part of a circulation that is being orchestrated by Victor Pinchuk, the oligarch, and the Pinchuk Art Center, which has sent exhibitions of art that essentially says Russia bad, Ukraine beautiful. And it's staged these exhibitions in UK Parliament, in the EU Parliament, and at Davos last year, for instance. And wow. um, it's almost kind of paralyzing to have to say this out loud because it's so kind of cringeworthy how predictable these moves are within the art world. Mm -hmm. But I wonder whether you as a critic, as someone who, who spends time thinking not about what's, you know, what culture is now, but clearly engaged with art history, short of getting a minor <laughs> in it, as you said, is it, has it ever been thus? Have we actually, has anything changed? And am I right to be slightly more suspicious than maybe a version of me in the hundred years ago would have been? This was a big tension that I think is very clear in the book. And it was a, a question that was put to me early on. You don't think there's any special quality to contemporary art that can do what, you know, generations of diplomats and specialists um, have failed to do. I mean, you're not going to go that far. Well, generations of artists, art. presumably, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. What does it mean if you know, okay, fine, an artist spends 10 years working on this and, and it changes absolutely nothing. The violence continues the war. It doesn't stop the war. It will never stop the violence. Is looking at 
history paintings of battles and seeing all the sort of gruesome details in, at you know strained bodies if it's not heroic is it a way does it sort of like sublimate the desire for mm -hmm. revenge does it help us live with ourselves uh, does it make us feel better about living in a world where these conflicts continue i mean that's a big question is you know aestheticization or reducing a foreign conflict or a foreign war to something digestible. I mean, this would, if this is the best that art does, it's awful. And, and, you know, that would be a big problem. So, so what do we just cover our ears? Or? No, I mean, I didn't know much about Orissa before I saw Amar Kanvar's work. And Amar Kanvar's work, mm -hmm. among other things, looks at the, the fight of multinationals and indigenous tribes for bauxite mining rights in these hills. Mm -hmm in the Indian state of Orissa, those hills are, are sacred to, I mean, they are the living gods of the population that lives there. And his work doesn't romanticize them, doesn't sort of fetishize mm -hmm. their indigeneity, but takes up a group of really renegade documentary filmmakers that are just trying to get evidence of what is happening and who's involved there. I also didn't know that that Orissa is full of archeological masterpieces, but now just because, you know, I've seen Orissa as the subject of his films, and I've tried to understand mm -hmm. what all these blurry images are, who are these people, who is actually fighting. I've learned a lot. And I do think that at their best, and this is a much bigger conversation, but I think at their best, museums can still try to be civic spaces and educational spaces in the idea that, you know, you continue to learn things for the rest of your life. And I think showing work like this in a museum can do that. And the most that I would claim is that if more people can learn about these things, you create the conditions where it is possible for those people to become people that would maybe do more to stop them. I do actually believe that that's possible. That might be the cheesiest thing I've ever said, but... <laughs> I, yeah, finally, a, a major point of disagreement. I, I definitely do not believe that our museums, as they are now, are capable of realising that mission. And it's not only because of the kind of capture by neoliberalist capital. It's, 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 I think, more a problem of a culture. But but that is your interest, right? Is that the is my thing. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really want to necessarily have the, the last word in this conversation, but I, I think the... The old liberal institution is definitely incapable of doing what you do. But at the same time, like in my kind of journey over the last the last couple of years, as a very mechanistic critic of the art world, you know, the same thing, the same way you described, you know, looking at the art market. I mean, I've also lived the art market as a gallerist for ten years, yeah. and then you know, then I decided to go and spend more time doing the, the like you know measurements and the, get out the calipers and the, the publicly funded bit of the art world to find that it was even more more corrupt and more rotten. Mm. But I think those critiques are easy. It is to me so staggering that we persist in replicating behaviors that we've already have evidence don't do anything. However, yeah. I'm going to turn this into a compliment. The thing that comes back time and time again in moments of despair for me is this hope that there is something that our human ability to engage in aesthetic expression could produce things. And your writing does that. Like you've produced an artifact that is in and of itself an aesthetic artifact, and it talks about artworks that are maybe easy to critique from my perspective, this kind of utilitarian way, but actually aesthetically even when they are these kind of shock ponies like Margulis in, in Venice. The, these yeah. are things that are our experience and they do mean something. So yeah, you're possibly in the end restoring my faith in, in art. Amazing. Gosh, to go and wash, Thank you. Wash, wash, wash my hands in the moment now. I don't know what I'm saying. This is Thank my you. entire thing is to, is to say art is bad. I stop it. Uh, no, but that's lovely. Thank you. Kaylin, thank you very much for, for the conversation and indeed thank for you. your wonderful writing. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Beautiful, gruesome and true is published by Columbia Global Reports. I'm Pierre Valencia. Thanks for listening and join us next time. <laughs>